as a beacon light for the need for freedom of thought and freedom of inquiry. And so free thought is, is part of the whole of human history. David Hume, that great skeptic. I'm bringing up some of the great figures in the history of thought. The, the, the leader of the Scottish Enlightenment. Next. Voltaire, yes, Voltaire, the philosopher in the, in the 18th century France who led to the Enlightenment. Next slide. He, no one after the, I'll read up. James Madison, who wrote the American Constitution and the first ten amendments of the Constitution, expects, especially the First Amendment. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, doesn't look like home him. I hope we have a younger Thomas Jefferson, who said religion is tyranny of the mind of man, often. Tom Paine, an Englishman who wrote uh, The uh, Age of Reason while he was imprisoned in France. He said by George Washington. Okay, next slide, please. Charles Darwin. Ah, the attack on Darwin t today is so embarrassing, so distressing that this is happening in the United States. One of the great figures of 19th century science. George Sand, uh, the French novelist, very, very important. Marie Curie stands out in the 20th century as a great free thinker. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who wrote the book The Woman's Bible, and the women's movement in the United States, which was founded in 1848, the leaders of that feminist movement were predominantly uh, secularists and humanists, and atheists too. John Dewey, we talked about him earlier, probably the leading philosopher in the United States in the 20th century. And Bertrand Russell, yes, Bertrand Russell, the great uh, 20th century British philosopher who stood for peace and was against uh, the nuclear bomb, uh, developed a campaign against that. And that is uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and uh, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, the leader of the feminist movement in, in France. I Isaac Asimov, a dear friend of mine, he published 500, over 500 books, and I was pleased that um, as the founder of Prometheus Books, that we published five of his books, and he would send them almost immaculate uh, at a photograph of men memory without any need for editing. Uh, this is uh, uh, Betty Friedan. Let me tell you about Fred Betty Friedan. I'm sorry that uh, Henry Morgenthaler is not here tonight. I must give him a call. But when Hen Henry Morgenthaler was imprisoned <coughs> In Canada, I organized an international committee to defend Henry Morgenthaler. Remember, he was placed twice after the, he was freed. He was again convicted and incarcerated, the double jeopardy. And so Betty Friedan and I came to Canada and stood on the steps. I don't remember if it was in Toronto or Montreal. Do you remember what that was? I think it was Montreal. Montreal in the early 70s. I remember afterwards we were at a reception and she was drinking Manhattans, I was drinking Manhattans. She says, why is it that I can't get a man to go to bed with me and unless I can get him drunk first. <laughs> I didn't have a second Manhattan. <laughs> She's a wonderful woman. Uh, Steve Allen, a dear friend. Uh, Steve Allen is really wonderful. Uh, I published 15 of his books. He was one of the leaders of the humanist movement in the United States. He helped uh, dedicate our Center for Inquiry in 1996. Uh, uh, he died a tragic death. He was driving along and a man came out of the driveway and banged into him. And the uh, man gets out and he says, oh, Steve Allen, can I get your autograph? <laughs> and Steve says, that's the damnedest way to get an autograph. <laughs> in any case, he went home and died that night. Oh, he had oh, oh, and he was working on the last manuscript. That, what was that, the Barbarians at the Gate? The Bulgarians yes. at the <laughs> Gate. <laughs> the Bulgarians at the Gate, yeah. This is uh, Carl Sagan, what a loss in the early 60s. We celebrated his, his birthday at the New York Academy of, uh, of uh, New York Academy of Science at that meeting. His Popular wife Andrew and was his there? wife Andrew Drinan was there. This is uh, Francis Crick. Yes, Francis Crick, the great discoverer, uh, a dear friend of mine of the DNA, and John Watson also. But you know, he's put his foot in his mouth, yeah. unfortunately, <laughs> by his remarks. This is Richard Dawkins now, who is. Uh, led a tremendous movement in this in the world 
uh, because he maintains the card is that the that's E.O. Wilson, who was one of the key members of our Center for Prairie, a uh, humanist laureate among others, and has made enormous contributions. Dan Dennett, he went to China with us, and we had a great time for a week uh, traveling up and down. Now, what river was that? I think it was the Yangtze River. Okay. And Andrin and the wife of uh, Carl, Carl Sagan. Now, I'll put the next one. Let me ask if they, they know who he is. Okay. Okay. You can get the slide, yeah. yeah. Now, here's a great Canadian who is a great humanist. Who is he? Who is he? Brock Chisholm. Oh, yes, he was one of the key people in the founding of the United Nations. The three founders of the United Nations, Sir Julian Huxley was the Secretary General, Lloyd Boyd or the World Food Organization, and Brock Chisholm, the World Health uh, Organization. And incidentally, the, the Center for Inquiry uh, does have a um, non-governmental organization as a non-governmental organization, consultative status at the UN, and we maintain a mission at the UN, and we're welcomed. Even the American delegation voted to admit us. They probably didn't know who they were voting for. <laughs> 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 we were very pleased at that. And incidentally, we want, we want if we can, uh, to get uh, one or two Canadians to volunteer to be on that UN mission. The Center for Inquiry, it's not an American organization. It's a world organization. And the uh, two great Canadians, Jim Alcock, great skeptic, and Barry Byerstein, who recently died, have been involved from the very start in our activities. So Justin, if you can <coughs> take the names of any people who like to volunteer, we read papers at the UN, uh, and we uh, partake of their meetings, and when uh, something important is up, it would be wonderful if someone from Canada could come to New York uh, for that. We also have representatives in uh, Vienna, Paris, and Geneva. Henry Morgenthaler, my dear friend, uh, how much I cherish what he's done. <clears throat> in 1969, we were on a boat uh, 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 opposite Pittsburgh, <coughs> the lake, at a, at a UNIS meeting, and he said, you know, I perform abortions in Montreal. I want to tell you that because I had begun the campaign for a woman's right to choose early. I said, that's wonderful. You want to do an article? He says, I dare not. I said, well, we'll do it uh, anonymously. So he published this article. At that time, he was a doctor in Montreal. <coughs> and uh, the Montreal newspapers picked it up because he talked about Montreal. And uh, who is this man? Who is this man? Eventually, he came out of the closet. And of course, he suffered for a few years persecution, but now is one of the top 100 Canadians of all time uh, because of his great contributions to the defense of a woman's right to choose. And who is this? <laughs> Margaret Atwood. She's just been elected to the International Academy of Humanism. I'm very pleased to have her. Well, uh, let's move on to the next. So that is a brief history, and I've only touched the surface. 60% of American scientists are secularists, atheists, agnostics, free thinkers, and 93% of the National Academy of Sciences fit that category. So we ought to be proud of the fact that we represent a dissenting point of view, that we have a noble tradition, traceable back to Greece and Rome, through the Renaissance, the development of modern science, the Enlightenment, the great battle for democracy, and uh, for liberation of women and gays and uh, disadvantaged people in our society. This is an heroic struggle. And humanism, secular humanism, scientific rationalism has been on that frontier. Now the question is often asked, what is secularism? I think you advertised this. I forgot, I didn't know what I was gonna talk about. I sent you a name, so I better say something about it. It's the new secularism, the agenda for the future. Yes, that has become the great battleground. And you were telling me, Nathan, who is coming all out against secularism? Oh, Newt Gingrich. Yeah, Newt Gingrich has yeah. now decided he's going to come <laughs> out against secularism <laughs> in a new documentary. Yeah. Can you hear that? Yeah. Can you get it put it up there? Okay. It's all right. All right. Uh, all right. Newt Gingrich, thank you very much. Thank you. How thoughtful. That's not a Christian act. That's a humanist act. <laughs> and... Uh, Pope uh, Benedict, <laughs> and uh, who's the name on this uh, 
TV show. Uh, I keep forgetting his name. O'Brien? O'Reilly. Okay. Oh, oh. <laughs> I've been practicing all the shows. But he invited me to be on the show and he wanted to, know, wanted to know if I'd talk about the theory of evolution. And I was talking to the, uh, the producer. I said, yes, but I also want to talk about the theory of gravitation. I'll get back to you. I don't know what to talk about. You never get back to me. What do you mean by secularism? First, separation of church and state. We have a tremendous battle worldwide. Not only among the 57 uh, Islamic countries, uh, among that set of primitive provinces further south of the border, where President Bush has been attempting to bridge the separation of church and state with faith-based charities, and everywhere, even here in Ontario, separation of church and state. So that's our front, first frontier. Now, I want to point out that 93 countries on the planet have some provision for separation of church and state. So secularism at that time, secularism in that sense, applies to the democratic world. France, Brazil, Mexico, so many countries had provisions for the separation of church and state. They often breach it, attempt to bridge it, but uh, nonetheless it stands as a great ideal. And that's our first battleground. And that is when I said to my dear friend who was a skeptic that we cannot be identified as atheists. No, I'm an atheist. We're not an atheist movement we're broader, we're defending secularism. And, uh, all right, that's the first point. Second point, the secularization of values. Ever since the Renaissance, human beings turned from thinking about divine things to focusing on this world here and now, to maximizing human happiness and fulfillment. And the whole of the modern world has become secularized. It's not only the separation of church and state, but the separation of economy and churches, the separation of sports and religion, the separation of every domain, universities, education. The modern world is secular. The modern world is secularly humanist. And it's the humanization of values and the effort to enrich, fulfill human life that is our central Sorry. So that's the second sense of secularism. Now a third sense is that we do appeal to non-religious people outside of or inside of the churches and mosques and temples. To people who are dissenters, who they may be non-theists or atheists or agnostics. So our clientele are non practicing people out there who are not religious and yet draw upon science, literature, the arts, for philosophy for inspiration. Let's go on to the next slide. Now the Center for Inquiry has, you have to take that thing from the background, take, take the, one, okay. the cosmos. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, what is, now I want to define secular humanism. What is secular humanism? When President Reagan, at, at the 1980 campaign, and his supporters began attacking secular humanism. No one could, no one knew what it was, and someone said, "It's like Jello; you can't nail it to a tree. It's very <laughs> difficult to define." I founded the Council for Secular Humanism in the United States. We're now worldwide, and we launched Free Inquiry in 1980 and took off right, right off. And in the last uh, 25 years, we've enlisted many of the leading intellectuals, scientists, doctors, lawyers, ordinary citizens, everywhere. And so let me suggest that there is, there are six main characteristics. I call it planetary humanism, a bold new paradigm for a secular humanist, atheistic humanist, agnostic humanist. But secular is a broader, secular is a broad and broader term, and it seems to me we can gain more people agree with us if we put it in those terms. 
First, first, we're committed to a method of inquiry. That is, we defend freedom of thought, freedom of, of research, the free mind, the free conscience, the right to, to know, aside, a, a, apart from any censorship, any restriction. And this has been a very difficult battle. Bruno is burned at the stake. Uh, Socrates was condemned to death by the Athenians for making the better appear the worse, for corrupting the youth of Athens, for denying the gods of Athens. He drank the hemlock. But there are, there's a whole history of courageous men and women who have battled for freedom of thought. And that's part of our movement, yes, freedom of thought. You cannot do science. You cannot write literature. You can't engage in political discourse unless, unless you have the right to do so. So that's the first point. And we say, going on from that, you ask the question, what is truth? Pilate allegedly asked, what is truth? And we raise that question. And our answer to that is that the most reliable method for establishing truth claims is based on the sciences. It is scientific, yes, my friend, Professor Pete back there. <laughs> the sciences in the last 500 years have made more progress in deciding what is what about the universe by peer review, by replication, by demanding evidence, by developing theories that are coherent, and making predictions on the basis of that. And that method, methodological naturalism, has stood the test of time. That method has given this great city of Toronto with its skyscrapers, its museums, its universities, its hospitals, its advanced status. The whole of the modern world is based upon science and technology. That is crucial. And what we say is, and what the skeptics say, when my good friend Eric McMillan, who is uh, involved with the Canadian or Ontario skeptics say, is that we need to extend the methods of science as critical thinking to every area of human interest. Yes, critical thinking. Before you accept the claim, find out of the sufficient evidence. If there is no evidence, then you ought to suspend judgment and be a skeptic. So you look for evidence. Now, sometimes we have to choose on the basis of the best evidence. You were forced to choose. But nonetheless, we have a model. And that is a model of, to develop reliable knowledge. It's the use of reflective thinking. It is the educated mind who is willing to raise questions, to doubt before he accepts or she accepts a position. So that's methodological naturalism. But now, second, you can show that, can you just show that one slide, that lovely slide. Second, and there's a tremendous deficiency here. People ask you, what is that? That's the universe. That's one galaxy from afar. But people ask you, what is reality? What does it all mean? How does it fit together? And our answer is, probably the most reliable method we have is the scientific method. So we need a cosmic perspective. We call it scientific naturalism. I think the most wondrous discovery in the last five years are the 250 new planets out there in new star systems. It boggles the mind. We're not limited to, to our solar system. You have the Copernican revolution. Yes, Galileo, Newton, and others. You have the Darwinian revolution of the 19th century that showed that the human species is one among others, evolving by natural laws, by chance and adaptation, mutations, differential reproduction. Uh, we have uh, the Explorers Club, and we sent uh, a whole number of people to the Galapagos earlier, uh, was it this year? This year, uh, to see the, the, the great variety in kinds of species. And so that's part of the cosmic outlook, scientific naturalism. It used to be called materialism, but that is often considered reductive. So it is materialistic. You look for the laws of physics, mass and energy. 
But you also look for uh, explanations in biology, uh, a kind of emergence. You look for it in consciousness, which is not separate from the mind, in psychology. You look for it in the social sciences about social institutions. So probably the best interpretation of the universe as we know it is based upon the frontiers of science and the sciences of the great advances. E.O. Wilson uses the term consilience, which we got, he got from Wig Ewell, a British philosopher of science in the 19th century. We don't have, and maybe we'll never have, a unified system of nature. Philosophers try to do that. That's very difficult. At the very least, we can develop empirical generalizations, a conceptual framework, which is always changing. And what does that tell us? It, tell, it tells us that the universe is expanding at great speeds, that there are billions and billions of star systems, galaxies out there, that we exist on one planet in the Milky Way, one galaxy, that we're not the center of the universe, that God did not create us in his image, that we've evolved along with other species on the planet Earth, that we have the powers of intelligence and reason to understand the universe, and we can develop moral principles in order to live together in society in a peaceful way. So in, a, in, any, in any case, we move on to the third picture, non-theism. And I, I prefer that time, that term, non-theism. Now, I am an atheist. I am an atheist, yes. But that doesn't define me. I'm not defi Look, I don't believe in mermaids, but I'm not an a-mermaidist. <laughs> I don't believe in the tooth fairy, but I'm not an a-tooth fairyist. Why should we allow the theist to define us? Let us begin ourselves. We reject these mythologies of the past, though we appreciate their role in human history. And we can read the Bible and Koran as literature that may be eloquent, not as true necessarily, reflected. The Bible and the Koran reflected the outlook of a primitive people on the eastern shores of the Mediterranean. Uh, and... Uh, their best view of the world, pre-scientific, pre-industrial, pre-urban, why should we, in the 21st century, be limited by the world outlook of the men and women who wrote the Bible, or the person who wrote the Koran? Now, incidentally, there are many Korans, you know, and we're not certain that the story about Muhammad is true at all. It's based upon hearsay. So, the Center for Inquiry sponsors the Committee for the Scientific Examination of Religion. And the general public is unaware of the tremendous scientific research into the origins of the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. We have what we call a Jesus seminar, a Jesus project, right, that we've just launched, and we're bringing together the best scholars to look at this evidence. But most of what people know about the Old and New Testament is based upon hearsay. It's not been corroborated by a sufficient number of reliable witnesses. None of the people who wrote the New Testament knew Jesus. None of them. They came later. This is based upon hearsay. And none of the people who wrote the Old Testament knew who Moses was, or Joseph, or Abraham, or even whether or not they existed. This is all exaggerated in the same way. And we've recently launched what we call Quranic criticism. Wow, that gave us a lot of trouble. Now I know in, in Canada you have the large uh, Muslim population. We have this everywhere in the world, growing Muslim population. And we appeal to our Muslim friends and colleagues if they accept democracy, and that they're good citizens, in the spirit of inquiry to accept the right of people to critically examine the Quran and the Hadith. 
and question them. And so we've done this. And so we don't think that the Bible is the word of God. It's inscribed by humans. The Quran was not conveyed by Gabriel to Muhammad. It was written by his companions two, three, four centuries later and modified many times. And so we're very skeptical about that. So we draw from modern science this rich literature of scientific literature, archaeological, anthropological, linguistic, semantic analysis of these great documents of the past. And the same thing is true of the Hindu tradition and Buddhism and the ancient religions which are historical artifacts. They cannot and should not dominate our lives in the 21st century. And, that, and the Center for Inquiry has attempt to make that clear. Fourth, we're committed to humanistic ethics. Indeed, at the top of our agenda today is the effort to develop a positive and constructive view of morality. The old-time morality you can draw certain principles from that, the, the common heritage of humankind, the golden rule, you should treat an alien in your midst as you would like to be treated, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, no, but love thy neighbor as thyself. There are many principles in the New Testament, even the Old Testament, perhaps the Quran, that in one sense, capture certain important moral principles, but they're very limited. In the name of God, you can stone to death homosexuals. In the name of God, you can stone bastards. In the name of God, you can stone adulterers. In the name of God, you can slam an airplane into the, the Twin Towers. Allah Akbar! It's poison, says Hutchins. It is. I mean, in the name of God, you can kill anybody, as they did during the Crusades, and they're doing as Shiites are killing Sunnis today. For what? An ancient document that has no truth and fact? So we remain skeptics about, uh, about that morality, and we're trying to develop a new morality. I'll talk about that presently. Fifth, we're committed to a social polity. We're, not, we're, we're a non-political movement. Now, although I made some uh, puns about Bush, it always gets a laugh. I used to make puns about Clinton or anyone else. <laughs> and in our free democratic societies, I'm sure you poke fun at your prime minister and so on. Yes, that's part of the democratic tradition. But we're non-political. We really are not. But we are committed to democracy and the secularization. <coughs> and last and most important, we've reached a point in human society where we have to develop a new planetary ethic not an ethic of Americans or Frenchmen or, or Indians or Chinese, but an ethic that applies to the global community in which we live. We're interdependent. As I went to China, spent two weeks in China, how wonderful the Chinese were. And come back to America, well, we may have to go to war with them now. They're building a fleet. We have to watch the Chinese and so on. I mean, those are the partisan politics of the past. The notion of a preemptive war in order to safeguard our oil resources are a very serious problem for everyone in the world. But we need to develop first a planetary ethic. So now, I see I've been talking, I usually need to talk at least 50 minutes, but I want to go over a bit. Uh, but I, I, I want to talk about humanistic ethics now. So the center of the battle today, we're faced with two moralities, two moralities. On the one hand, the morality of theism, obedience and submission to God and his commandments and people lay down and pray in submission to God. We focus on, as humanists, human freedom and the autonomy of individuals to make their own choices and not obedience. Second, human beings are unable to solve their own problems without God as interpreted by priests and mullahs and rabbis and popes and others. They're all too human. We have some confidence in the power of human intelligence, courage and goodwill 
to solve problems. And what else do we have if not our own intelligence and goodwill? Third, human beings original sin are corrupt by original sin. Speak for yourself. <laughs> I think that human beings can be poten potentially capable of either good or evil. And they can, under proper social conditions and education, develop a positive outlook. That's why moral education is crucial for us, to realize human potentialities. And there is a good scientific literature we had at the Center for Quarry in Buffalo. Uh, we were I was in China then, I think, or New York. York. New York. Uh, Mark Hauser wrote this recent book on moral minds, and science, scientific inquiry seemed to suggest that do unto others, it's another book by Elliot Sober, a philosopher, and Wilson, that, uh, that in one sense there is a kind of intuitive innateness uh, in the human species. That's an interesting hypothesis. They say, where does your ethics come from? from the process of evolution where certain groups which develop moral rules of behavior were able to survive and transmit that propensity to others. So that's a hypothesis. In any case, fourth, venereal. Why is it that sexuality, the most beautiful, eloquent, intimate experience of human beings, is a sin? And most of them regulate sexuality. Fourth, human sexuality is a source of intimacy and trust, diversity in, t in taste and proclivity, and should not be condemned. Okay, so now we go on to the ethics of humanism. And <laughs>